Hello and welcome to Lecture 3 of Changing Magnetic Fields in Phys 1204. We have an informal statement of Faraday's law from an earlier video lecture. Now it's time to write down a mathematically precise statement of Faraday's law. Our informal statement of Faraday's law says that a changing magnetic flux through a loop induces a current in the loop, or equivalently it induces an EMF around the loop. This process of producing an EMF by changing the flux through it is called electromagnetic induction. We've mostly focused on doing this by changing the B field strength, which is one thing that the flux depends on. But there are other ways to change the flux, because if you have a flexible loop or some other way of changing its area, that will also allow you to change the flux through it. And that dot product involves the angle between the area vector and the B field, and so changing the orientation of the loop relative to the field will also induce an EMF. We now want to develop an expression for Faraday's law, and we're going to keep things simple. The easiest geometrically to analyze is the situation where we change the area of the loop. Faraday's law says that whenever the magnetic flux through a loop is changing, an EMF is induced in the loop. And so, to get a more precise form of Faraday's law, we need a direct relationship between the rate of change of the flux and the EMF. So here is our simple geometry involving a change of area of the loop. We're going to have a moving conducting rod, but this time it's in contact with stationary wire rails as it moves through this uniform B field. So I want to be clear, the gray rod is moving, but the orangish wires are not. And we can use the right hand rule as we have before to see that the magnetic force on positive charges inside the rod is up. That'll cause charge separation and an EMF induced across the rod. Note that because it's in contact with these wires, no charge builds up at either end. The plus and the minus are simply indicating the high V and low V sides of this EMF across the rod. Now this looks a lot like the situation we've seen with a loop moving through a B field, but don't be fooled. Because with the loop moving through the B field, there's an EMF induced at both ends. And so it acts just like a circuit with two batteries like this, which means no current. But we only have an EMF across the rod, and so there will be current flowing in the direction that I've indicated, because the flux through the loop is increasing, and we know whenever that happens, there will be an induced current. But now notice that the rod is a current-carrying conductor in a magnetic field, which tells us that there's going to be a magnetic force acting on it. Again, you can use the right-hand rule and find that the magnetic force on the rod is opposite its direction of motion. So if no other forces act on this rod, it's going to slow down. I want to keep things simple. I want a constant rate of increase of the flux through the loop. And so let's not have this rod slow down. That requires that we pull on the rod in the direction of its motion. So there's some, say, contact force by some external agent, perhaps your hand, pulling on the rod so that it moves at constant velocity. And so, for constant speed, we need the magnitudes of this contact force and the magnetic force to be equal. Let's think of our system as just the rod, and we're going to think about the work on this system. So note that the system is just the rod, it's moving at constant speed, it has no potential energy, and so the change of energy is zero, which tells us the work done by the B field on the rod and the work done by the external agent add up to zero, or in other words, one is the negative of the other. Well, look, the, work, the force by the external agent is in the direction of motion, so it's a positive work. The work by the B field is opposite the direction of motion, so that's a negative work. But all of this work is eventually going to be dissipated as thermal energy in the wires. That's not in our system, but I want to point out that that tells us the work by that external agent 
is the same size as the work by the B field, and that all is equal to the change in thermal energy due to resistance in the wires. And if you think of that circuit then consisting of the wires and the EMF across the rod, that tells you that the dissipation here in the wires is equal to the work done by the induced EMF, which is just the amount of charge transported through the rod times the EMF. Keep that in mind, that's going to be crucial. In particular, the fact that the work by the external agent is equal to the work by the induced EMF is going to be important to us. So, we now know that this contact force has a magnitude that's equal to the magnetic force's magnitude, and since I've arranged for everything to be perpendicular, the cross product comes out easily, and here's the magnitude of that force. And so more to the point, that tells us that the work done by the external agent if the rod moves some distance, delta x, is just this. And over some time, delta t, the rod's displacement magnitude is just going to be its speed times delta t, and so I can put that back into the work equation. Note that the current is just the amount of charge transported through the rod, divided by the time it took to do it. And so if we plug that in, the delta t's are going to cancel, and here is our work by the external agent. And that work is equal to the work done by the EMF, and so that shows us that that induced EMF is just related to the length of the rod, the B field it's moving through, and its speed. So now we've got an expression for our induced EMF, and we want to relate it to the rate of change of the magnetic flux. And we know the flux is changing because the area of the loop is increasing. So at some time it has some area. And at some later time, when the rod has moved further on, it has some new area. And during that time, the rod has moved some distance delta x. And so the new area is just a rectangle over here of height L and width delta x. And so that in particular tells us that the rate of change of the area of the loop is just L delta x over delta t. But delta x over delta t is just the speed, v. And so there we have our expression for the rate of change of the area of the loop. Now let's use that with the magnetic flux expression. Here's the definition of the magnetic flux, but we need to think about what our sign convention is, or in other words, what our convention for the direction of the area vector is going to be. Since I want to relate this to the induced EMF, let's take the convention that for B fields going in the direction that would be produced by this current, in other words, out of the page, we would get a positive flux. This is a choice. And so that says we want our dA vector out of the page. All right, so that means b dot dA, since b is into the page, is just negative b dA. And I've said that this is a uniform B field, and so I can pull it out of the integral, and so this is just the area of the loop. And so now my rate of change of the flux is just b times the rate of change of the area of the loop, but that's just lv. Hey, look, my rate of change of the flux is just the negative of the induced EMF. And so if I take the limit as delta t goes to zero, I just get this relationship, and this is Faraday's law. Notice what this negative is saying. It's saying that the EMF is such that it produces a current in a direction that opposes the change in the flux. That's just Lenz's law. So Lenz's law boils down to this negative sign inside Faraday's law. I've derived Faraday's law using this very special, simple case of a rod moving along wires, but it turns out to be a totally general law. 
showing that is much harder, and so that's something you might see in a much more advanced course. I'm going to take this as a time to point out a key difference between EMFs and potential differences. Here's a loop of wire in a uniform B field, and this B field is increasing in magnitude. And we know that the rate of change of flux here, because this is a simple geometry, is just going to be the area of the loop times the rate at which the B field is increasing. You can use Lenz's law to say, well, we have a delta B into the page, and so there will be an induced B out of the page, which the right-hand rule tells you will generate a current around this way. If we change the size of the loop, none of that argument changes. We would have a current the same way. But now look at the difference between the two loops. Because in this loop, we have a smaller area, and the rate of change of flux is proportional to the area, and we know from Faraday's law that that is telling us the size of the induced EMF. And so the larger loop will have a larger induced EMF. But remember that that induced EMF is a work per unit charge done. And so the work per unit charge going around here is larger than the work per unit charge around here. That tells us that this bulb will be brighter than the one in the smaller loop. But the really key thing is it tells us that works done by EMFs are not path independent. And so unlike with a potential difference, we cannot define a function of position, a potential, to describe an EMF, because the work done is not path independent. Let's finish off with a practical example of how to make a generator. So you take a coil, you spin it, say with a diesel engine, and you put it in a B field generated, say, by two poles of magnets. And let's say we have a modest B field of 0.01 Tesla, easily achievable, a little coil of one centimeter by one centimeter, and we're spinning it at a thousand RPM, which is also quite doable. I've converted that to an angular frequency. And let's figure out how many turns we need in our coil to get a reasonable EMF. So, we know that our magnetic flux is just going to be B dot A. Because all the geometry is simple, we have a flat surface and a uniform B field, except we have to do that for each turn, and so we have to multiply by our number of turns. And so we have n b a cos theta, but theta is just increasing as omega t. And Faraday's law tells us that our EMF is just negative of the time derivative of that flux. So we have a fluctuating sinusoidal EMF, this will give AC current, and here it is. What's our max? Well, that's just when the sine is 1. And so our omega is 10 to the 2, our area is 10 to the negative 4, and our B is 10 to the negative 2, and so this overall gives us an EMF that is 10 to the negative 4 volts times N, and so if we want, say, a 0.1 volt EMF out of this, we need a thousand turns. If we want a bigger EMF than this, then we should either spin it faster, or use a larger coil, or, more difficult, use a stronger B field.